university. And I have to tell you, it was at dinner with Farah on Valentine's Day, fittingly, with Farah and Lena Chino, who's sitting in the back, that Farah said to me, Sita, I think you should organize a public screening of The Handmaid's Tale on the night it's broadcast on Hulu. And I said, OK, right on it. <laughs> so, but really, it wouldn't have happened without the generosity of Margaret, who has literally just stepped off an airplane from all of her triumphs in the United States. So, Margaret, we're really pleased that jet lag hasn't kicked in yet. So, which is why, you know, you know, her generosity knows no bounds. So, without further ado, Alyssa, the floor is yours. Thank you. That was um, really wonderful and disturbing to watch on so many levels. And I guess I will probably just lead off with uh, a general question, which is that there has been much talk about the relevance of The Handmaid's Tale at the contemporary moment. And I wondered if perhaps you could reflect on that as the author, what it meant to be in conversation with the filmmakers at this particular moment, because there's so many things that come out in just that one episode, the question of totalitarianism, the question of memory, this apparent sameness among women, which is something I'd probably also like to ask, because this sameness is obviously sort of disturbed by all kinds of racial and sexual differences that um, are really interesting to think about. Uh, the complicity, betrayal, and uh, relations of community among the women and so I'm just wondering about what it meant for you, not the audience or people who've been sending your book to the top of the charts, in terms of what has it been like for you as the author, thinking of putting this into circulation at this contemporary moment? Um, and, and did that shape the kinds of conversations you had with the filmmaker and the kinds of things that you felt were necessary to either emphasize or do a little differently um, with, with, this, with this series? Okay. Um, summing it up, one word, weird. <laughs> so definitely weird. But backing up a little, um, it wasn't my deal. So the television rights went with the original uh, film rights back in 1990. And then it all disappeared into a sort of labyrinth because nobody, people lost track of who owned it. Um, they made some deal with the distributor, and then the distributor went bankrupt, and then somebody bought their assets, and somebody else bought theirs. And when we traced it all down, and it took a year uh, to try to figure out who actually owned the television rights, um, it turned out to be MGM. And Daniel Wilson, you saw his name, uh, he was the original producer. So I wasn't... Um, asked whether they could do the show. I was informed that they were doing the show. And then I had the choice uh, as to whether I wanted to be a consultant, which of course I said yes, but if you know the film business, you know what that means. It means that you can have lots of conversations, but you have no control over what they actually do. The final decisions are the people making the film. However, that being said, I was very lucky because the team that they put in place wanted to be faithful to the core of the original work, although they also wanted to update it to now. So lots have changed between 1984 when I first started writing this book in West Berlin while the Cold War wall was still in place and, and now 2017. So some of the changes that you might have noticed are because the past of Offred in the series is our now. So we could start from a, we could start from where you all are right now. And therefore, in the in the book, it's a segregationist bunch, and they're shipping everybody who isn't them off uh, hither and thither, and you don't see those people. But they made a decision to update it to now, and it would be much harder to do that. Uh, there are many more uh, intersectional friendships, relationships, um, kids with two different kinds of parents. You know, that, that is happening now in 
in cities, and this is out in the city, I mean, the takeoff point is the city. Uh, in fact, it was filmed in Toronto and, and Hamilton, <laughs> cheaper that way. Um, but <laughs> but that, that, is, that is her past. Her past is our now. And you'll notice in some episodes later, well, you saw in this one, they've got cell phones. So they didn't have cell phones in 1984. Hate to break this to you, but they had not been invented yet, and they didn't even have lattes. <laughs> There's a, a scene in I think it's uh, episode two where where a latte purchasing um, or a latte credit card failing to work in the latte shop moment takes place. Um, so the only data control thing that they had in 1984 was credit cards. Now they've got lots more. And I hope you all know that when you're on the run, you take get the SIM card out of your phone and you crush it between <laughs> two rocks because you read that in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, didn't you? <laughs> you know how to get rid of that. Uh, so, so those were some of the decisions. And they thought them through quite carefully. And we had long discussions about them. They also cast the commander and his wife younger than they are in the book. And they did that advisedly as well, um, because they wanted um, to up the ante. They wanted to in increase the um, tension. There, there might be a possibility for the Serena Joy character. She, she does, just doesn't really know. And she's also, therefore, going to be more sexually jealous of the off-red character. Um, so those were some of the things that they um, talked about. Um, but there's there's a lot of sort of guidance notes in the in the historical notes as to as to where these things came from in real life because it was my rule not to put anything in that did not have a precedent somewhere at some time so it had to have a basis in reality and as they have built it out and you will see as you watch the series that they can follow characters to places that the book doesn't cannot do, because with the book we have a single point of view, and once somebody disappears from that point of view, that person has no way of, of finding out what happened. Uh, she has no access to information. Uh, but in the, in the series, we can follow those characters. So um, they stuck to the same rule. Nothing can happen to those characters that does not have a basis in reality at some time in some place. Is, is that any help? <laughs> poor, poor Bruce, <laughs> poor, poor Bruce Miller, who is the central main writer and the, and the showrunner, and has, has wanted to do this book ever since he read it in college. Uh, of course, the producers were originally looking for a female writer. Uh, he made a very strong pitch. He introduces himself by saying, I'm Bruce Miller. I'm the Chief writer, I'm the showrunner, and I've got one penis too many. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, he made up for that by hiring a bunch of uh, women in the writing room, except he says he can't get them to agree on things. <laughs> so, so from a woman's point of view, do you think this is yes, no, yes, no, and then they have a fight? Uh, so that's instructive for him, but why should they not have different opinions? Men do. <laughs> Tara? Uh, there's a mic coming to you. Oh, thank you. Um, it was really intense to watch this and, and think about what's been going on. Um, and I think the, the conversation that, that I kept being thinking in my head was around betrayal of women by other women. And so we see this on campus with campus sexual assault and women feeling betrayed by their elders or peers when they're not believed and seen. And we see this in terms of this, this show where there's so many incidents of women participating or leading violence against women, right? And I wanted to know more about that theme of betrayal and, and how women also harm each other and are okay, complicit so it's, it's not just about women, it's about no. people. Yeah. It's about a totalitarianism. But I think okay. sometimes we assume, I, the thing for me is we assume yeah, that okay. women will be on the side. Yeah, I've got more to say. Uh, <laughs> so in a totalitarianism, um, Who's been in one? 
sure some people have. Um, we, we showed this film, we, uh, we, we showed the 1990 film in West Germany, and then we went over and showed it in East Germany, because it was a, the exact same moment when the wall was coming down. And the reaction of the audiences was very different in each place. Um, so West Germany, they're talking about aesthetics and directing and, um, you know, color choices and um, biographies and things like that. East Germany, the wall had, was still being taken down right then. They watched it very, very intently. And then they said, this was our life. And they didn't mean the costumes. They meant the feeling that you couldn't trust anyone. And since we have opened up the files of East Germany, we know that, in fact, that was kind of true. That there, there were a lot of people informing on a lot of people. <coughs> not because they were women and not because they were men, but because that's what happens in totalitarianism. And one of the things that, happens in, um, that happened in colonial situations was that the um, colonial overlords, as it were, would always, if they could, raise an army or a control group from among the group being controlled. So my totalitarianism is no different. Like all of them, it is the shape of a pyramid. Um, it is a totalitarianism in which the people at the top are men, but the ranking females are superior in power to the men at the bottom. So inferior in power to the men at the top, but superior in power to the men at the bottom because that those things tend to arrange themselves like, like European aristocracies. Or we need not even say European aristocracies, like aristocracies. Um, so, so, so that's just what has happened and what would happen. There would be um, a, power, a more powerful group, and people will, of course, some people will always accept a position in which, although they don't have a lot of power, they've got more power. So Aunt Lydia has more power than she would have if she weren't uh, a member of the aunts. It's a privileged group with lesser power, but with power within that structure. And um, within the aunts group, of course, there are all kinds of motives for, for doing that, just as there are in real life. So some people are true believers. They really believe this. Um, some are opportunists. This is where to be, where you get power. And others are um, in it just for the exercise of power. And that has happened time and time again in, in history. So starting from the premise that women are human beings, a radical position of mine. Uh, there's no particular reason within that group called human beings that women are necessarily going to be behave more angelically than people have behaved in history. With that being said, some people do behave angelically. <laughs> some men behave angelically, some women behave angelically. There have always been resistance movements in, in these kinds of things. Uh, people risk their lives to save other people, and you will see that in the series as well, because that too has happened time and time again. Uh, there's a very interesting book written by a man who was saved in Holland um, during Second World War, during Hitler. As a child, he was saved and hidden out, and he grew up. And the question that bothered him when he was growing up was, was why did people save other people. You know, what was it? What was it that they had that other people did not have? Uh, because at this, in the same period of history, people were, of course, turning other people in. Uh, so you had both betrayal and resistance and saving other people. And he went and interviewed the people who had saved other people and said, why did you do it? You, you could have been killed. And they, he said, I was expecting to find that it was an ideology, that it was a, po a political um, decision, that they all had some politics in common, that it was a religious thing. He said, I didn't find any of that. that. That wasn't what I found. What I found was that when presented with the choice, 
unless they chose to save the person, their image of themselves would have been destroyed. But who they thought they were would have been, in their view, irreparably damaged. So it comes down to Shakespeare, character is destiny. <laughs> but, but, but why should we? Why should we expect all women to behave well? Why should we? Why should the bar be higher for them? I support the right of Lady Macbeth to exist. <laughs> so we've got a question at the back. Um, so there's an assumption in my question, and you can feel free to tell me that that's wrong, and we can be done with it. Um, but I assume that you've been hearing for the last 20 odd years about different people's reactions to the book. And speaking as somebody who read it in high school. 30, 30 odd. Exactly, 15 years ago. Um, I'm curious if people's reactions, and especially students, have changed. Yes, they, they have changed because conditions have changed. So at the time the book was published, in about 1985, 6, uh, we were in a period of um, what shall we call it, even, Audie? We shall call it uh, somewhat a period of somewhat exhaustion in the women's movement and a period of somewhat younger people saying, well, that's something my mom did, uh, and I'm not a feminist, but. So we were at, we were at that period. Um, but we were also at a period in 1995, and you probably remember having this conversation, Eve, do you remember having this conversation on Sullivan Street, in which you said, basically, if you've been reading what's been in the papers about this and that and this and that, because we had that conversation. Um, there, there, the, there was an uprising of the push back. So with any, I think, social, social uh, let's say, with any human rights that, that get fought for and achieved, there is then there's a push to do that, and then there's a push back, and then there's a push, and then there's a push back, and then it that does tend to go like that. So we were also at a period of push back. It was the Reagan period. Um, so there was, there were not only people saying what they would like to do if they got power. Some of those things are things they are now doing because they have power. Um, but there was also some consternation that people were saying those things. Um, being as old as I am, and having gone through a number of totalitarianisms in the world in my lifetime, I'm not someone who has ever believed it can't happen here. So, so that was happening in the 80s. Then we had 1989, 1990, when the Cold War wall came down, and you got people saying, end of history. Let's, let's all go shopping. Uh, end of history, no more ideologies, boot, boot. Uh, and, and that ended in 2001. People who had been paying attention knew that it was never true. Uh, but when, when you do something as momentous as uh, the fall of the, the former Soviet Union, do you know that game called Pick Up Sticks? So you move one stick and you touch some other sticks and then they all move. So, in, in, so, so things moved around quite radically in that time period. And uh, they had actually started moving around in 1978. The kickoff moment for what, is, what we have now been living through is 1978 when Daoud, who was the leader of Afghanistan, was was killed in a coup. And the, there was a knock-on effect from that. It was um, socialists in Afghanistan then made their move, conservatives pushed back against them, socialists invited the Russians in, the Americans got involved, and here we are. It was 1978. And the fall of the former Soviet Union was connected with that. Uh, Afghanistan has been called the graveyard of empires for a reason. No one has ever managed <laughs> to put in a 
central controlling government over all of Afghanistan ever. So for the Russians, it was a lot of money that they poured into it with very bad results for them. Can we have somebody on this side of the room? So, and now, Sorry, and okay. now, of course, we have the election of Mr. Trump. So that has changed things radically um, in the way that people view this book. It's, there have been upticks in, in the two previous elections when the wise Republicans said the kinds of things they were saying, such as um, there's real rape and unreal rape, and, and, and if it's real rape, the woman doesn't get pregnant because her body has a way of shutting that down. You may not have known that biological truth. <laughs> <laughs> they were saying things like that, and every time they said things like that, there was an, an uptick of the Handmaid's Tale meme. You know, you get people saying, somebody needs to tell them this isn't a recipe. Uh, and that happened in the two previous elections, but um, those people didn't get elected, and this time they did. We've got, yeah. Um, hi. I'm wondering um, what, in watching the film on a big screen with great sound tonight, pleased you? Whether it pleased me. Yes, and what specifically pleased you watching it? Okay, so I did it last night too. <laughs> <laughs> that was in Los Angeles. Uh, and I had also done it before because the first time we screened it was also on a big screen. So I, I think big screens, bring a lot to um, a film experience. But I may be very old-fashioned. Uh, I, th I think people also have a way of hooking their computer up to a flat screen and seeing things in bigger format. But I'm, I'm working on that. I don't know how to do it yet, but I'm, I know that you can. <laughs> so yes, I, I prefer that. Um, did the laughter in the theater surprise you at all? No, 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 no. Those bits are supposed to be funny. <laughs> Insofar as anything is in, in this film. Anybody back there? Why is it set in the States? Why does who? Why is it set in the US? Why is it set in the US? Uh, because that's where it would be. So, <laughs> the book is in part an answer to the rhetorical question, if you're going to have a totalitarianism in the United States, what kind of totalitarianism would it be? Um, and you can draw a dictator meter, I'll tell you how to do it. You, you draw a circle, you put at the top dictator, at the bottom you put anarchy. Then you draw a line through the middle, which is the nice place to live. And you draw an arrow pointing up towards dictator on one side of the circle and one pointing down towards anarchy. And on the left side of the circle you put L and on the right side of the per circle you put R and you put similar arrows. So when you get the arrows either from L or R going up to the top, you get a dictatorship. <laughs> no matter what they call themselves. When you get the arrows meeting down at the bottom, you get anarchy, no matter where that's kicked off from. So, um, given the United States and its history, its foundational history, we, we can pretty much guess that it would not be a dictatorship of the left, and it would not call itself communist or anything like that. Uh, you would not get support for that. You would not get the crucial amount of support for that that you would need. Um, I used to think that you could not logically have people say, um, so this is a liberal democracy, and in order to preserve the liberal democracy that we have, we have to take away all of your civil liberties. I used to think that, <laughs> but I'm, I don't know about that anymore. I think people are quite capable, they're getting to be somewhat capable of saying that. Um, but I, I think it would be likely to be um, something that that flew a quasi-religious type of um, flag and, and justified its actions uh, in, in some kind of um, quasi-religious way. And since the majority religion 
that's there right now is a quasi-religious um, thing. I say quasi because I don't consider some of these people very Christian, really. <laughs> Note if you take what are supposed to be the core, <laughs> the core ideas, <laughs> um, that you would get something like that. Yeah. So we've got one over there and one here. I just wanted to know, in the book, we don't know her name, and you decided to give her names in the show. Was it your choice, or was it? OK, this is a, the, na the name of the character in the show is a choice that has been made by the readers of the book. And they have made this choice really quite a long time ago. And it's the same kinds of people who play those online games in which there's clues, and then somebody else has a clue, and then you put them together, and you decipher them. Um, and they're very close readers. And the close readers decided, and it makes sense. It wasn't my initial idea, but I'm buying it because it makes sense. <laughs> that all of the names mentioned in the first chapter, the names that they pass around amongst themselves, all of them appear subsequently in the book, except for June. So therefore, you would have to deduce that her name is June. So I'll go with that. It was the readers who figured it out. <laughs> And I had to agree with them because it made perfect sense. So maybe my subconscious was at work, or maybe it was just a uh, happy coincidence, but that seems to be her name. Well, thank you so much for being here and, and doing this. It's, it's incredible. On your uh, circle uh, diagram, that uh, where would you place um, religion uh, versus or, and politics, uh, mindful, and I'd like your reflection on the situation in France. France did capitulate to fascism, actually, at the beginning of World War II, and in two weeks there's going to be a very important election there. How is this film, this book, being received in France? And of course, uh, that's formally uh, a secular country. And so there's a kind of a tension between the secular ideas of fascism and then religious totalitarianism, yeah, I mean, I'd like okay. your reflection on yeah, that. Yeah, well, okay, I, I think fascism was a kind of religion. Okay, so for me, a religion is anything um, um, that can create heretics. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> um, so, and you know, Maoism, yeah, lots of heretics. Um, so in, it's a, it's a kind of, it's, it's an, an ideological absolutism. And, uh, and we can't pin that on every religion and, nor every believer in a religion because a lot of people who believe in religions for their personal, um, in their personal life and take great comfort from them and feel uh, upheld by them and things do not use them to subjugate other people and cut off their heads or whatever. Um, so, so to me, those things are just ways of exercising power. And the way of exercising power might be through saying you have to be a true believing red guard communist and off with your head if you're not. Um, or it might be, okay, now we're going to be in the Inquisition and burn Joan of Arc at the stake. Uh, so it could be either one um, or, or anything that, that uh, that assumes that kind of absolute um, rightness. You know, out, we are absolutely right, and if you disagree with us, you are absolutely wrong. And, and how has the book been received in France? Is how has the book been received as, in France? Yes, in France. Um, they haven't had the show yet, but they will. <laughs> <laughs> they will have the show. The book has been you know, there for a long time. The, the thing about Europe versus, North versus the United States is that they had religious wars for centuries. Uh, centuries and centuries. Uh, Huguenots versus Catholics. Uh, that child stealing was something that was done to Huguenots in the 18th century, among many other groups. Child stealing is a really old human motif. But among the people who got their children stolen were the Huguenots and among the people who scratch things on walls, and you're gonna see some things scratched on walls in this film. Um, two noteworthy examples of scratching inscriptions on walls 
for other people to say just in case. Was a, a Protestant person, female person, walled up in one of these um, castles where they put people and she scratched on the rim of the well the word in Latin, resist. So this has been going on back and forth uh, for a very long time. It's not a question of religion being bad and you know atheism being good or any of that kind of thing. There have been some, some very respectable, repressive atheist regimes. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a question of power. Who's got power? What do they use the power for? Is it absolute power? And what sort of justification are they giving for the bad, powerful things that they do? Has England had any tyrants? Yes. Several. <laughs> Henry VIII built worthily a lot of Greece upon the escutcheon of England, as Charles Dickens said. He was very tyrannical. We just don't think of it in those terms. Somewhat, but not as bad as him. Thanks. So there's a hand back there. I think we have time for a couple more questions. So, Was there anything uh, about the Americans' reaction this time to the series that surprised you? And then I have a naughty question. I want to ask you how you lost your passport. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it's very naughty. Uh, all is well. It's been all solved. I don't have to live in Cleveland forever. <laughs> uh, so the question, how did the Americans this time, because of the situation that they are finding themselves in. So back in 1985, it was a mixed reaction. Um, some reviewers said, can't happen here. Noteworthily, Mary McCarthy. Um, I'm not convinced by this, said she, but I don't like credit cards. Um, but that, that was then. And I, I think had Hillary Clinton been elected, it would have been a different reaction. It would have been more like, few look what we just avoided. Uh, but that isn't what happened. So the entire cast of the, of the series woke up on November the 9th and looked at each other and said, in essence, we are no longer in a fiction. You know, this is much more the quality of a documentary. <laughs> so the thing acquired more gravitas, and the reviews have been universally spectacular, and I have to, I have to think that that is in part a relation to the political situation that they find themselves in. It's, it's no longer a thing that you can brush off or deny. Um, despite the outfits, you know, I don't think they're going to go as far as the outfits, <laughs> although many, although many societies have, and linking clothing or articles of clothing to a person's visible status, that's a very old thing and has been used very frequently. So they may not do that, but they're certainly rolling back reproductive rights uh, at the state level right now. And you probably noticed that the Texas legislature had a visitation of handmaids who went and sat in it while a bunch of guys were deciding what to do with women's bodies. And uh, they just sat there, and there's a picture of them surrounded by men with guns that could be a still right out of the television series. So the reaction has been very um, intent and I am waiting for the stream of hate mail that I'm sure will shortly arrive, but they're, they're in a slight difficult position with that because you wouldn't want to put your hand up and say, why are you attacking our wonderful ideas? <laughs> Without having to admit that they are your wonderful, that, that, that that is what you would in fact like to do. So we'll see how that plays out. I've started to see a few, this is, this is liberal bullshit <laughs> so I may get some, this is liberal bullshit, maybe. And I'd like to ask those people, what do you think would be a good idea instead? So Robin? Um, hi, Margaret. I just want to say, quick story. Um, last time I was in a room with you, I was catering an event, and I dropped a table on you and um, Adrian Clarkson, so I would like to apologize. <laughs> um, and this is a much 
better was, was it a big table? It was a, it was a big table. There was a lot of wine involved. It was bad. Um, this must have been a while ago. A few years, I think. Yeah. Um, but sort of to follow up on, on your last answer, how are you reacting to um, some of the comments from the cast? Try to um, distance this as a Okay, as so a I had somebody in the audience at that event who said it was misrepresented on Twitter, in case you're interested. Oh, good. So there. And she said it was the moderator who kept trying to get the actors to say that the only reason they had done this was for an ideological reason. And people are always trying to put artists in that kind of position. Um, they, they want them to either declare, uh, yes, I'm just a megaphone for somebody else's ideas and I'm a crappy artist. Uh, or else, no, I'm just an artist and I've got no interest in the ideas whatsoever. And that is not the position of the cast. Um, so that was a, a misrepresentation and a taking out of context. Uh, I think they, if, they, if they had said, it is not only a feminist story, but also, uh, or the other thing to say is, somebody said, it's a survivor story. Actually, every feminist story is a survivor story anyway, so why do we make a dichotomy? So like that, and uh, as I said on my Twitter, um, um, it will all be all right. That's very relieving. Thank you. Yeah, no, they were not doing that at all. Fiddle and game. I mean, uh, it was Elizabeth Moss who got everybody some baseball caps with don't, don't let the bastards grind you down embroidered on them. <laughs> so there. So I think we have time for two quick questions. There's a gentleman back there, and there was this lady here. And then I think we're going to get kicked out of this room. Hello. Hi. Uh, in your first response tonight, you said uh, you talked about updating the film in terms of Oprah's past being our contemporary world. You'd also mentioned uh, relationships being uh, intersectional intersectional relationships being introduced into it. I wonder if you could think through the writing process of writing the novel in terms of some of the casting choices and things, uh, particularly in terms of race. In the novel, it seems to be very stripped. Uh, race well, seems to be very stripped In the away, novel, so. the regime is segregationist. Mm -hmm. So they are doing that, uh, your drinking fountain over there, my drinking fountain over here thing. Um, so that's what was much more true uh, as a lived experience. Not that it isn't in some places still pretty true, um, but, but they are making that official. So um, all Jews have to be sent back to Israel. There is a, a very strange section of fundamentalism that believes that they all have to be sent back there because otherwise you can't have the second coming. Did you know that? Yes, we do. Um, so, so hold out some people, let's avoid the second coming. Just so, you know. um, so, so they're doing that, and they're doing that to, to black people as well. Um, but even in the book, there are some people who uh, are, you know, maybe somewhat mixed, the Marthas, for instance. Um, but by the time we get to 2017, particularly in a city like Toronto, it would be very hard to find a person below a certain age who does not have friends uh, of many different kinds and who does not have, for instance, um, gay friends of some kind who does not have uh, people who are of a different ethnic background. This is the most ethnically diverse city in the world, says the United Nations. So, it's, it's going from a reality like that, or a rea reality like that of New York, um, cities like that. Um, so that's where we are now. And in 1984, we were not. It was different. There weren't any Latins. <laughs> so we've got one and we, last And we had not invented a lot of the words that we currently use. We had not invented them at all. We had not invented intersectional. <laughs> so it's, you can't actually take a novel and ask it uh, why it wasn't using words that weren't invented yet, <laughs> like latte. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be our last question. Hello. 
Uh, better be good. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> we, we'd invented espresso, though. That had been invented. Uh, I was going to ask you what your favorite kind of caffeinated drink is, but I don't have to anymore. Um, last week, I had the opportunity of seeing some of the items in your archive at U of T. Uh, which is pretty incredible, including the first handwritten draft of Handmaid's Tale. What were you doing in there? <laughs> uh, anyone can access the archives, which is pretty yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, did you get into the clippings file? Yep, I did actually, and I saw some of the, the book covers from all over the world. Um, what do you think the value is in having this really amazing archive that I think is around 600 books strong and uh, having it open to the public so people can see your process and see your handwritten draft with all the crossed out words and the notes on the side. And I also hear that you're really big in Iran. Yeah, I can imagine why. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, people do make the mistake of, of saying, well, of course, it's all based on, on, on Muslim religions, isn't it? And I say, no, no, it's not. All you need to do is turn back the clock to about it. 1850, and you find, you know, that and more. Um, who could own property, what you had to wear, and all the rest of it. My, one of my friends just sent me a, a list of reasons that you could get put into the women's insane asylum between 1867 and 1888 or, or so, and I think I'm going to put that up because it's just fascinating. Um, it included novel reading. <laughs> but, but a lot of sexual transgressions with different men. Um, so archives. Well, I, I think my, re my reason for giving my papers to the uh, university is actually threefold. Number one, if I didn't do something with them, the house would fill up. <laughs> I wouldn't have anywhere to put them. Uh, number two, they have them all nicely arranged. And, and labeled, so that if I need to remember something, like, <laughs> what the heck was I thinking back in 1984? Um, I, I went into them myself recently, and, and, and there it all was. I mean, it all sort of comes back to you. Um, so it's like, a, it's like an aid memoir for me, that I can remember what I was, what was I doing? I can remember it, it better that way. And the third one, of course, is I get a tax write-off. <laughs> let's, let's, let's be frank. Um, so those are the values to me. As to the values for other people, I think they have different agendas. And I, I have no way of knowing what some of those agendas might be. I mean, somebody could go out in there in quite a hostile way um, and root through all my papers trying to find out what transgressions I may have done. Ha, 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 I didn't put those in. Um, <laughs> so I think it's like that. And I think they've now acquired a sort of a, a, a quaint analog um, ambience. You know, they're, they're, they're on paper. And I was writing in ink <laughs> with a, and also with a typewriter. So don't you think that's quite archaic and <laughs> antique and sort of cute. <laughs> I really enjoy like reading your comics as well. My comments. Comics. Oh, my comics. <laughs> my comics. Yeah, my comics. Yes, that was another phase. Oh, look. You're going to get flowers here. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not for me. They're for you. Oh, that's exactly. lovely. We had to go out and check to make sure they didn't clash with your scarf. Oh, did you? Yes, just got these. I think they're just lovely. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. But I would like to thank
Yes, and the college will be making a donation to leave as an impetus to have you do the same. So please do donate.